So today uh, we have a guest speaker for the department, uh, part of our uh, public lecture series uh, on transition studies. Uh, so Leona Nan uh, did her undergraduate work and her master's work at uh, Beijing Kuomintang University, Bay Wai, and then came to Hong Kong where she got her PhD at uh, Hong Kong University. Uh, and she's now a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Baptist University here in Hong Kong. So we're very happy to have you here today with us to share your research. And you'll be speaking on speaking in the first person singular or plural, multifactorial, multifactorial speech, corpus based analysis of institutional interpreters. So, Nana, please. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. talk about my research on close partnerships here at DUHK. One of the first thing that interpreting educators and practitioners tell students is that the professional interpreter speaks in a first person singular. But in interpreting for political institutions, shifts from the source first person singular, noun phrases, zero pronouns which are allowed in languages such as Chinese and Spanish, the passive, they, to the first person plural, have been identified as the most frequent category of pronoun shift in English, German, bidirectional, simultaneous interpreting SI in the European Parliament, in Cantonese English SI in the Hong Kong government, in Mandarin English SI and consecutive interpreting CI in Chinese government. In this talk, I will identify factors that influence first political institutional interpreters' first-person choices. I will disentangle the social, cognitive, and linguistic explanations proposed for this plural preference. Using first-person shifts as an example, I will show you one way of using multifactorial methods to describe the context of interpreters' choices. I will also highlight that how the usage-based cognitive linguist theory is relevant to a multifactorial understanding of translation and interpreting. In this talk, I'll briefly outline the social, cognitive, and linguist explanations proposed for the plural preference. I'll also show you how those explanations are inadequate to a multifactorial understanding of translation and interpreting. I will uh, talk about the theoretical approach I adopted, the speech corpus used, and the methods based on that theory. I will show you some of the findings and conclude by highlighting the implications of this study to translation and interpreting research. First, these course analysts have proposed social explanations for the first person shift. This line of work relies on the theory of discourse meaning, and I will only focus on one of these social explanations, institutional alignment. This theory posits the ideological ceiling of first-person plurals in encoding the one of us, or us versus them, differentiation. This line of work relies primarily on transcripts, except for Bittenton, who listened to some interpreting recordings in an ad hoc manner. They propose that first person shifts are prompted by topics that encode one of us or us versus them, such as the Israel Palestine relationship, which exemplifies the us versus them paradigm, and interpreters and speakers' loyalty to the institutional positions. Based on the trans comparison of source target frequency tallies, this line of work identified that as a result of interpreters strengthening institutional alignment compared to resource speakers, the plural lemma, the single word, we, increased in frequency in interpreting, which is delivered by with stress, disfluencies, and self-corrections. In some instances, the underlying referent of the plural also shifted. For instance, from the source, the Czech presidency, to the target, the council. Second, first person shifts have also received cognitive explanations. This line of work relies on the cognitive law theory or cognitive linguist theories, such as priming. Priming is essentially
essentially repeating. Self priming means to repeat structures one has produced oneself, and other priming means to repeat structures produced by others, such as soul speakers. This line of work also relies on transcript, but I propose that we also need to consider the audio recordings. This line of work found that the plural forms formulaic sequences with neighboring materials, such as we need to, we would like to, and we will continue to. Such formulaic sequences reducing the fluency and speakers and interpreters cognitive effort. The analysis of audio recordings is relevant here because according to theories of intonation meaning, for a construction to qualify as a formulaic sequence, it has to be fluently delivered, integrated with neighboring materials, and lose the ability to attract stress. As for the shift in the underlying reference of the plural, this can be explained with reference to the boundaryless hierarchy, which describes non-modifier relationship and is, is represented by this long arrow. On your right, the article is the most bounded to the noun it modifies. And on your left, relative clauses and adjectives are least bounded to the noun they modify. A positive relationship between boundedness and processing ease have been identified such that the article is much easier to process than the, than the adjective thereby explaining the interpreter's preference for the console, which is modified by the article. But first person shifts have also received linguistic explanations. When interpreting from zero subject languages such as Chinese and Spanish into subject obligatory languages such as English, some first person shift additions are necessary. For instance, this example is taken from Leon Howison. Uh, to my mind, the most insightful finding in this work is that here the interpreter could have selected the single lemma as in we might to people's interest first. But instead, they chose the formula. We will continue to. The cognitive and linguistic explanations that align with each other in their focus on plural formulaic sequences. Insightful as these studies are, they are largely monofactorial, meaning that they consider either social or cognitive explanations. In contrast, this study is multifactorial because, to quote the Sutta and the Fiat, translation and interpreting are inherently multifactorial and simultaneously constrained by social, cultural, technological, and cognitive factors. Second, comparing the source frequency, source target frequency tallies is a decontextualized way of using corpus data. Previous studies often do not consider that the context of the recipient language could favor the plural, pulling interpreters to use the plural. The context in the interpreted speech may also favor the plural, pushing interpreters to use the plural. In contrast, in this study, I will comprehensively describe the intro and intercultural context. Third, most previous studies use transcripts because prosodic transcription is prohibitively time consuming. In this study, I will introduce an automatic cross linguistic prosodic analysis method. Fourth, this study is also among the first in the field to make all data code methods openly accessible as an open science repository so that all of the findings, methods, and data that I'm going to present to you are verifiable and reproducible. Recall that my theoretical objective is to conceptualize translation and interpreting as a multifactorial process and product. For this objective, I adopted the usage-based approach, which is best summarized by this triangle here. 
This approach posits that language structures emerge from language use, hence the name, as general cognitive abilities. In this study, um, dealing with a structural problem, first person shifts, and I hypothesize that such shifts emerge from the usage context in interpreting, which I will describe using a speech corpus, and the interpreter's general cognitive ability of chunking. Chunking is the combination of units that are often used together into a larger unit in memory. It is a general human cognitive ability, which, as you may know, is most famously studied among expert chess players. With repeated chess practice, the experts connect the pieces on the board into little chunks, memory units, which facilitate their fluency and ease in performance and ultimately contribute to their expertise. Similarly, in language tasks, repeated usage and chunking prompts the formation and use of formulaic sequences. The formulaic sequences can be neural chunks, memory units in our brain. Chunking can also lead to a famously studied structural change called grammaticalization in certain contexts such as political speeches and construction, such as plural constructions. Grammaticalization refers to the process whereby words lose their semantic meaning and acquire grammatical functions. Grammaticalization is evidently influenced by a range of grammatical patterns, co-occurrence frequency rise, association with structural priming, prosodic fluency, Morphosyntactic boundedness, phonological integration, semantic, the loss of semantic meaning or semantic flinching, the loss of prosodic stress and phonetic segments. Because of the similarity of first person patterns and grammaticalization, in this study, I will comprehensively describe the first person patterns in grammaticalization terms. So, based on the theory, and the literature, I hypothesize that by the social explanation, speakers and interpreters indicate their alignment with the institutional position on ideologically salient topics by using a larger amount of plural lemmas, which are associated with ideological meaning, delivered with disfluencies and stress. In contrast, by the cognitive and linguistic explanations, when speakers and interpreters are faced with effortful and zero subject context, they will use plural lemmas, which are marked by co arise in co-occurrence frequency, association with mobile syntactic boundedness, structural priming, loss of meaning, segment loss, integration, and fluency, as well as the loss of the ability to attract stress. So the social explanation poses the plural to be less grammaticalized than the singular, whereas the cognitive and linguistic explanation poses the opposite. Moreover, zooming on the plural or plural constructions in interpreting and non-interpreting, but the social explanation Interpreters strengthened institutional alignment compared with source speakers by using more plurals, associate them with ideological meaning, deliver them with disfluencies and stress. Whereas the cognitive and linguistic explanation posit that interpreting is more cognitively challenging than non-interpreting, and interpreters had to deal with source zero subjects, so they rely on plural chunks. So in sum, the social explanation poses plural constructions in interpreting to be less grammaticalized than those in non-interpreting, whereas cognitive and linguistic explanation poses the opposite. Uh, 
and a question for you. Great question. So to document the usage context of the first person choices, I used a speech corpus. The parallel data come from the uh, Chinese premier's press conferences where the premiers talked about mainland China, Taiwan, and international relations. Congress spokesperson did housekeeping and reporters asked questions. This uh, uh, was a sample from a larger project. And here are five different staff interpreters of the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs did consecutive interpreting. The staff interpreters owe their loyalty only to Chinese premiers. To establish the recipient language baseline, I used the State of the Union addresses of the former US president covering issues on the Iraq war, US issues and international relations besides that war. The parallel and comparable corpora are similar in delivery mode, time frame, speaking time, and register. Let me briefly explain why Bush's State of the Union addresses is the most similar with that of the interpreted speech in register. Uh, this study is based on uh, a 2.5 million word corpus and the Python program I created. So this figure on your left shows the, reg the degree of register similarity among 16 registers. And the length of this branch Connecting two registers uh, is the degree of similarity measured by Euclidean distance. For example, as you can see on the top, popular law and humor are connected by a rather short branch, showing that they are the most similar. And moving down a bit, the registers <coughs> indicated with stars, the length is also very short, showing that the register of the interpreting English speeches of both Premier Li Keqiang and Wen Jiabao is the most similar to that of Bush rather than Obama. So that's why I chose Bush as the recipient language baseline. I'd be happy to talk more about this uh, study in the Q&A. Now, my um, goal here is to identify the factors that influence the first person choices based on a description of the context. For this purpose, I adopted the behavioral profile approach, which means to extract a large amount of competing choices, 2.4K here, and code those occurrences for an exhaustive list of social, cognitive, and linguistic variables. The social variable is indexed by topic. The topics of Taiwan, international relations, and the Iraq war are considered ideologically salient and may favor the plural. As you know, the PRC government asserts that Taiwan is part of one China, evoking the one of us paradigm. Whereas international relations and the Iraq war are characterized by the polarizing us versus them rhetoric. At the same time, I included cognitive and linguistic variables some of the which are shown here to describe the morphological, morphosyntactic, prosodic, referential, semantic, syntactic, and structural context of first person choices. I want to draw your attention to the last one at the bottom of this table. Other priming involves both linguistic and cognitive explanations. Uh, in the case of Mandarin source zero subject, it's about linguistic explanation, and in the case of first original first persons, it's about first person priming first persons. So it's both a cognitive and linguistic variable. Uh, for, to address the boundary of orality in corpus linguistics, I introduced the tone and break indexes, a convention that applies to 20 languages, including Cantonese, for Mandarin and English to describe the speech prosody of Mandarin and English um, utterances. This convention targets two categories of variables, prominence type, which refers to the degree of stress in a syllable, with the most stress syllable B, 
being the nuclear accident on your right. And the break index describes the level of disjuncture between two words. So four represents a significant pause, one represents fluency, and zero represents syllabic merging, such, such as will, I think we will. To annotate these variables, I used a, an automatic tool. The results are shown in the bottom, and it also describes the pitch level of words. So let me zoom in a little bit. By FPP construction, first person constructions, I mean the first person and this first right hand word and second right hand word. So here the automatic tool detects that Bu, the first right hand word, was delivered with a high pitch. So it labeled it high H. And the first person pronoun was delivered in a low pitch. So it's possibly non prominent. Whereas the whereas Bu could be the nuclear accent. I then double checked the results uh, manually. And this picture here shows the same segments analyzed in the previous step. And I confirmed the um, prominence types and break indexes of the first person constructions here. So the average intra annotator agreement between round, uh, two rounds of annotation reached 92.45% indicating the reliability, the high reliability of this method. My explanatory goal, based on the description of the usage context, is to arbitrate among the three explanations and show how they interact and override each other. For this purpose, I adopted the multifactorial prediction and deviation analysis using regressions, didn't use random forest in this study, and let me first explain what a regression is. So a regression describes the relationship between a predictor and an outcome. So here on, in the figure on your right, as the value of the predictor x increases, the value of the outcome y also increases. This is a linear relationship which is represented in this tilde. So this is a linear regression. Regressions can also be conducted between a predictor and a categorical outcome. Here it involves the mathematical transformation of the outcome into the probability of one level of the outcome relative to that of the other. So in the figure on your right, when the value of the predictor x increases, the probability of the plural rather than the singular increases. So this is a logistic regression and it's about the probability of one level of the outcome relative to that of the other level of the outcome. Both linear and logistic regressions are used in this study. So to recap the hypothesis, by the social explanation, the social variable should exert a greater influence on speakers and interpreters' first person choices. And by the cognitive and linguistic explanations, cognitive and linguistic variables should play a greater role in speakers and interpreters' first person choices. So to operationalize this idea, I first established two baselines, the source speech and recipient language, which are the baseline in any translational phenomenon. Um, this baseline, the baselines are established by using the social variable and cognitive variables to predict the speakers, the Chinese speakers and the US president's first person choices. So here, um, the linguistic variable doesn't apply because they don't work cross-lingually, they don't do interpreting. And the referential variables had to be taken out because as you can see here, the singular I only refers to a person, so non-phrase. Non a person is not a non-phrase. 
So if I enter into such a variable into the programming language R, it will co report complete separation error. So here is how I establish the, first, the two baselines of the source speech and the recipient language. But what I'm really interested in in this study is interpreters' first person choices and how they deviate from their, those of sole speakers and the recipient language speakers, the US president. So to investigate the deviation, I used the source and recipient models to predict interpreters' choices. This is doable because all the, all the three varieties were annotated using a similar set of variables. Let me explain with an example using the source uh, model. So here, the unshaded call three columns are some of the interpreting data. And the light blue column is the result of the prediction analysis. And by comparing the predicted first person choices with interpreter's actual choices, I obtained two columns on the right, two dark blue columns. So these two columns quantifies the deviation between interpreter's choices and source speakers or recipient speakers choices. So it addresses two questions. Source like targets whether the interpreter's choice is the same with that of the source speaker in a similar context by topic and cost type. And the second variable, deviation score, quantifies the degree to which such deviation occurs. And it's based on the predictive probability that I shown in a previous figure. The variable deviation score is purposefully structured such that when the interpreter's actual choice is the plural, but the sole speakers and the US president would have chosen the singular in a similar context, deviation score is positive. And when the interpreter's actual choice and the predicted choice are the same, so like it's true, yes, and deviation score is set to zero. When interpreters chose singular, but a sole speaker and the recipient language speaker would have chosen the plural in a similar context, deviation score is said to be negative. So the deviation variables quantify the weather and the degree to which interpreter's choices deviate from those of the source speakers and the recipient language speakers in a similar context. Any questions here? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, the 0.7 and the minus 0.5. Yeah. Does the negative versus positive have any implications? Yes. So when the deviation score is positive, it means that interpreters chose the plural. I set all the models to predict the plural. But a sound speaker, a Chinese speaker, and a native language English speaker would have chosen the singular. It's different. But when the deviation score is negative, it means that the interpreter chose the singular. But native speakers of Chinese and English would have chosen the plural. So it's purposefully set in this way. Thanks for that. Uh, can I ask why the deviation score of uh, 0.7 is 7, and then the other one is 0.5? So why is 1.7 and 1.5? Uh, so it's based on the whole model. Uh, the whole model involves a lot more variables than, I shown, I don't, than I've shown here. So the 0.7 and 5 are based on the predictive probability of the singular. And it's actually 1 minus probability. The value is 1 minus probability and depends on all the other variables in that model. So in this case, it was less likely, in the first case, the plural was the same, it was less likely that they would choose that, so the fire rate was higher. 
And then in the second case, it was more likely that they would do that, so the variability was lower. So they, uh, for in the first case, when it's 0 0.7, that means that the interpreter's choice deviates a lot right. from right. the inter so speaker's choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So uh, after obtaining the deviation variables, I want to see why that deviation occurs. So I used the social and cognitive variables to predict the two deviation variables to see why the deviation happened and what caused it. This is the third step. And in the final step, just now we have to take out the referential and linguistic variables. So um, in this step, I first investigate the effects of interpreting on plural constructions so that I can include the referential variables and to see how interpreting affected the referential variables and cognitive variables. And in the final step, I examined the effects of source target context on directly on interpreters' first cho person choices. So here, I allowed the social variable times means interact in, re in regression and allowed the social variable to interact with all other variables to see which variable has a topic specific effect. In other words, I want to give the social variable one last chance to manifest itself. And the other variables include predictors of the source model and linguistic variables, which represent the source context. And cognitive variables measured in the target, which represents the target context. So in this way, I analyze the context of interpreter's choices, both from the baselines and from the choices itself. So now on to the findings. For the first baseline, I analyzed over 600 occurrences and the performance of regressions is um, examined, evaluated using the same score, which ranges from 0 0.5 like the flip of the coin, to one, which means perfect prediction. So you can see here that this model performs very well. And all the uh, effects are represented in effect plots like this, here showing the predictor, cause types effect on the probability of the plural. So every other level of a categorical variable its effect is compared to the reference variable the, on the probability of plural. So statistical significance here means that the effect of coordinate and subordinate causes on the, on the probability of plural are significantly different from that of the main cause on the probability of the plural. So here you can see that when the cause is of complex coordinate or subordinate, the probability of Chinese speakers using the plural is very high, meaning that Chinese speakers use the plural in complex contexts. And when the source speech features a model, an obligation model like in Gai, Bi Xu, a possibility model, Nang Ke Yi, the probability of the plural is also very high showing that Chinese speakers rely on plural and obligation model, possibility model chunks. Moreover, when the Chinese speech, the deliberate of the Chinese speech increases, the probability of the plural also increases, meaning that Chinese speakers associate the plural with fluency. As for the effect of the social variable, on your right, you can see that when the topic is Taiwan, the probability of the plural is very high, much higher than other topics. This confirms the social explanation for Chinese premiers. As for the second baseline, its analysis is based on seven, over 700 occurrences and a high-performing model. So similarly, when the cause is when the English cause is coordinate and subordinate, the probability of the plural is very high. 
and when the labor rate of the US president increases. So here, I could not enter the uh, modality variable here because as you can see, the uh, English, we must, we should, we can, we may, chunks are so prevalent that it causes complete separation error to the model. So here, similar to Chinese speakers, English speakers also use we, plural and obligation possibility model chunk. Um, moreover, the social explanation is also partially confirmed for the US president, as you can see from the center. When the topic is the Iraq war, the probability of the plural is very high, much higher than other topics. So how do the interpreters first person choices deviate from those of sole speakers? This analysis, this analysis is based on over a thousand occurrences. And here I first show the effect of the predicted modality on the first deviation variable, sounds like. So when the modality is obligation, we must, we should, interpreters was highly likely to choose the source like pattern of plural chunks, plural and obligation models, meaning that interpreters rely on plural chunks to a greater extent than source speakers. And then the effect of topic. So on the on your left is the effect of topic on the first deviation variable, source like. When the topic is Taiwan, Interpreters' choices were rather a bit unsource-like. And on your right, the effect of topic on deviation score. When the, effect, when the topic is Taiwan, deviation score is negative. Meaning that interpreters chose the singular, where Chinese premiums chose the plural. This is a highly significant a significant pattern. It shows that the frequency of the plural decreases in Taiwan in interpreting rather than source speech. This does not support the social explanation. How do interpreters' choices deviate from those of the US president? This analysis is based on a thousand occurrences and as you can see here, the effect of cost type on deviation score, when the cost type is main, is the main cause, interpreters prefer the deviation score is positive, and interpreters use the plural rather than the singular, as in the US president. And I inspected the underlying data. It showed that whether the choice is singular or plural, interpreters prefer the simple main cause. It, they prefer a simple syntax. So in this case, interpreters' choice for the simple syntax supports the cognitive explanation. The effect of interpreting on plural constructions, this analysis is based on 1,400 occurrences and a high-performing model. So, the effect of referent boundedness on the plural in interpreting or non-interpreting shows that when the referent is modified by the simple article, that click, this or that, the probability of the plural in interpreting is very high, supporting the prediction of the boundedness hierarchy and the cognitive explanation. Moreover, as for the phonological, the variables related to orality, when the first person is delivered with fluency represented by one, the probability of it being in interpreting is high, meaning that interpreters associate the plural with fluency. Moreover, the neighboring words of the plural in interpreting are most likely non-prominent. As you can see here, it's the first right-hand word of the plural in interpreting. And the second right-hand word, both are likely non-prominent. 
This supports a high degree of grammaticalization in first-person construction and interpreting. Finally, the analysis of the source type context on interpreters' choices is based on over a thousand occurrences and a really high-performing model. It shows that when the source speech has a complex coordinate and subordinate syntax, interpreters will very likely to choose the plural to ease their cognitive effort. And when the source has is the source subject is other pronouns such as they, which are infrequent in the data set and assume difficult to process frequency and is positively related with processing ease. And when the source subject is a complex noun phrase, is zero, a zero Chinese subject, and the plural, interpreters will very likely to choose the plural. All this support the cognitive and linguistic explanations. So what the, how does the institutional alignment explanations really work? The most interesting finding of this study is the only interaction term identified in this model, that between topic and source verb type. As you can see from the top left plot, when the source features a verb denoting emotion or a wish, the probability of interpreters using the plural are very high and statistically significant. Only in the context of international relations, all other effects are non-significant. So at last, we arrive at a unified explanation that considers the social, international relations, cognitive, source priming, and linguistic, verb type, emotion, or wish together. In other words, for the social explanation to play its role, it has to meet the following conditions. The topic has to be international relations, the source has to feature an emotion or wish word, verb, and the source subject should not be the plural, but the interpreters chose the plural. Are there such cases in interpreting? Ten years ago, when Premier Li Keqiang was answering a question about China-US relations, he said, I I hope. But his interpreter said, we hope. How many such cases are there? Out of the 1,000 occurrences of first-person choices in interpreting and analyzed, there are only five. Testifying to the limited explanatory power of the social explanation in interpreting. In sum, in this study, I have shown plural first-person constructions in interpreting to achieve a high degree of grammaticalization, evidenced by the rise in co-occurring frequencies of plural chunks, the association with morphosyntactic boundedness, structural priming, fluency, integration, loss of semantic meaning, stress, and segments. Overall, first-person shifts are best explained by chunking facts when interpreters deal with complex and zero-subject context. The social explanation is rejected except for the interactive effect it participates in. But I acknowledge that we need to consider, we need to compare the choices of institutional and freelance interpreters to further confirm this pattern. Using first-person shifts I have exam as an example, I have shown you the superiority of multifactorial designs. All the multifactorial models achieved a near perfect accuracy. But monofactorial models achieved an accuracy rate of 
just slightly better than the post of a coin. I also showed you the way to operationalize and conceptualize context in interpreting by using by adopting the usage-based approach and multifactorial methods. I also introduced an automatic cross-linguistic prosodic analysis with high reliability rates to corpus-based interpreting studies. All of the data, findings, and methods are verifiable and reproducible. Using first-person shifts as an example, I have shown the relevance of usage-based multifactorial designs to translation and interpreting studies. Rather than dichotomizing source or recipient conversions, such designs show plural constructions to exist on a continuum of association strengths of quantitative changes, not qualitative, across unrelated languages, Chinese and English. Rather than exceptionalizing translators or interpreters, such designs show that plural chunks are memory units in human cognition, whether they are Chinese interpreters, Chinese premiers, or US presidents. Rather than compartmentalizing social, cognitive, or linguistic explanations, such designs offer a unified account of the translator and interpreter's language that has rarely been done in the field of translation and interpreting studies. If there's only one thing you take away from this talk, I hope I have shown you that a translator and interpreter's choice is simultaneously constrained by and manifested at many levels that make the notion of a unidimensional or priori framed institutional interpreter problematic. Let me conclude by quoting Gideon Turi. An empirically justified theory of translation and interpreting should consider how a single factor can be enhanced, mitigated, maybe even offset by the presence of another. If this is the goal of translation and interpreting studies, then one must recognize translators and interpreters as the complex agent in persons that they are. With that, I thank you for your attention. process. 
using this method, but um, actually this can be this is doable using other methods that I'm pursuing right now, time series. And for the question about how dynamic this triangle is, I'm able I was able to pinpoint at a very high resolution that in this context the interpreter's choice is this, but source speakers and target and the recipient language speaker would do that. So this is analyzed in every instance of the interpreter's choice. So in this context, the effective chunking is record recorded in the deviation variables and how the interpreter's choice is deviated from those of source speakers in every instance of the occurrence. So apart from the variable, the context that I've shown you, I also show that um, the interpreters were more likely to simplify the syntax. And uh, when the uh, source speech is complex, or when this happened in the source speech or that, the interpreters would do that. So to some extent, this method has to has re recreated the, con the dynamic context in interpreting, but I definitely agree that to fully recreate the linear and multimodal context of interpreter choices, we need time series and other computational methods that I'm currently pursuing. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, thank you for your speech. I think it's very interesting that you, there is a slide you mentioned that uh, the like when previously used I, the interpreter tend to use we, like wo. Uh, the interpreter used we a lot, I think, in one of your slides. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very interesting because I think that this is interpreting from Chinese into English, mm -hmm. which means that that English message will pr probably have an impact on the international audience. So I want to know if your study also cover the potential impact that this, this kind of interpreting may have on an international audience because I agree what, with what you said in your conclusion that interpreters and trans translators are definitely uh, complex and agentive persons rather than like, I think your study also shows that maybe faithfulness is not a very useful concept. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's so different when, when I say I, if my interpreter says we, that's so <laughs> different because the, the audience might feel like uh, the, the speaker is representing the whole entity, but what to see on wall, which means that it's also probably my personal statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just curious if your study also covered that. Thank yeah. you so much for yeah. this very interesting question. I think it's about <laughs> triangulation, uh, the pro product perception uh, and process. So here I only presented product and process analysis. I didn't present the perception of first-person ship. Actually, I did that in my PhD dissertation. The, um, the perception of first-person ships, if we take this out, it shows that I did a very large-scale uh, survey online targeting 3,780 US residents. And those residents report that when the um, interpreted speech feature a lot of plural constructions. Mm -hmm. They perceive the plural, this speech as more fluent okay. yeah. and okay. easier to process than those that don't have that many plural constructions. Mm -hmm. But the thing with plural is that, as I said, it's highly grammaticalized. So many of, of it does not encode semantic meaning. The, change your perception that you have talked about is more likely to occur in semantic oh, right. words. Yeah. For instance, let me give you an example. In my data, there was um, a speech that Premier Wen Jiabao talked about anti-corruption, and he um, alluded to Chairman Mao and uh, some uh, the demise of Ming Dynasty. The US residents I surveyed have hold a very negative opinion about that speech because simply they don't like Chairman Mao. Mm -hmm. And they don't like, they don't really know the um, historical stories about the demise of Ming Dynasty. Mm -hmm. So the change of perception is more likely a result of semantic words mm -hmm. than 
first person constructions which are parameterized. Thank you for this. Thank you. Could I ask a follow up question? Yes. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Like, you can go up first. Yeah, so um, I remember one, in one part of the speech you talk about non institutional interpreter. So I'll, I'll be curious about that because I used to do interpreting in, in Taiwan and I'm now working for for the government and actually I worked at the university but they know me so I, I did freelancing for them. So I would be wondering about whether there will be the same results for non-institutional interpreter if they were put into this kind of same setting, political interpreting. Mm -hmm. So what would you think about that? Yes. Um, the problem, that, that's a really good question, but the problem is that I'm not that equipped to answer that question because there are uh, so few interpreting corpora in Chinese and English. So most of the data we deal with uh, come from institutional interpreters. But I would hypothesize that freelance interpreters are likely to use the plural in complex and zero subject context as well because of the general ability of chunking and repeated usage, which make plurals into chunks. Mm -hmm. But all those five cases, at least from what I can see, are quite idiosyncratic. But it does pick up a pattern that, in the context of international relations, Chinese interpreters are more likely to, to do this. But for a balanced comparison of freelance and institutional interpreters, I would say that there may be idiosyncratic um, choices as well, but overall I would say it's about the ability of chunking and the complex context. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think it's a very interesting topic to discuss this, like uh, uh, I or we. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, I noticed that in one of your findings, I think uh, uh, one of the trends of this research is that it's uh, uh, can be verified, right? And mm -hmm. also can be it's reusable, right? Mm -hmm. It's reusable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so my question would be like uh, I think it would be very uh, very meaningful if this can be uh, reproducible. So you are using uh, some uh, the, the data that you collect, mm -hmm. right? It's uh, if I'm not wrong, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, it's from uh, Li Keqiang's. Uh, yes, Li Keqiang, and some of uh, or putting a simple way, very specific. Um, people or like the, the very specific locations. Um, so, and also you choose the President Bush, right, which is also very specific mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, the discourse or like the speech, right? So, uh, uh, my question would be like uh, this reproducible that uh, you mentioned here can, mm -hmm. in fact, does that mean like if I choose uh, some other political uh, like a uh, uh, speech or conference that come from maybe President Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. and uh, can that also be, like the result also comes out as the same, or like does that apply to, in general, like um, reproducible, like, you know, that we reproduce in other occasions? That's a great, great question. I think the word you are talking about is generalizability. Uh, can, yes, yes, or like more, I, um, I would like more explanation of how reproducible this research is. Yes. So uh, actually, uh, as for the data, I actually used more than Li Keqiang. I used both uh, Wen Jiabao. I sampled three years from Wen Jiabao's um, premier years and the uh, three years from Li Keqiang. And uh, there are five different staff interpreters. So for interpreting, it could be considered as OK sample-wise because interpreting data is so small in general. But I would say that about the generalizability, of the findings in this study, I would say I should, I would, I would feel pretty confident because all those uh, models achieved a very high accuracy and the variables that I can think of are all included and they, all the analysis have been conducted and verified um, if you are talking about the diagnostics of the regression models all the diagnostic model um, results are openly accept accessible as well. So I would really welcome people who work on the UN simultaneous interpreting corpus and other uh, interpreting corpus in other fields and other languages to 
try to reproduce and to use the code and the how to see how the data structure can impact the findings and the generalizability of these findings. I would really welcome any reproducible studies. Yeah, have you have you tried to put other other um, corpus to just try to see like other than the sample that you use? Is there, have you ever tried to reproduce it in another with another materials? Oh, so I'm currently working on a remote interpreting corpus using UN data. I haven't done the exact statistical analysis, but it does. There is, is a pattern that UN interpreters use the plural constructions in complex contexts as well. But these are like general pre preliminary observations currently. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, no, I, I don't know anything about interpretation. But one, one, is, like one question that comes to my mind is, if I were the interpreter, if I were the interpreter interpreting for key people like the Fed Town and whatever, would I dare to change it so easily unless I was taught to do so? These five interpreters were from the same institution, basically, am I right? Mm -hmm. So could it be the case that they were trained or taught to change the eye into woman instead of translate directly? Mm -hmm. Because now we started with a, a, a statement at the beginning that for all interview students, we were somewhat taught to translate I in, uh, to translate the singular, uh, third person, uh, first person. So this was our training. But for institution judges, would they be actually taught to adopt a different model because they are representing some some high level or whatever? Now, if this is the case, I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing because it's, it's just it's a common sense of guessing it. If it is the case, then what is the significance of doing this research? That's a really good question. So you're saying that the, the, the shifts in first persons could be a matter of institutional requirements. I don't know, just guess. Could be, right? Because if I were an interpreter, yes. I would not easily change the words of the and the time. So, so, and then this has uh, uh, so suggested that this might have impact. Yeah. And with this serious impact, would I, as an interpreter, mm -hmm. make these changes easily? Well, yeah. I agree that this could be an institutional requirement, so people from the higher up ask the interpreters to do that. But the, the problem is in this data set, those five occurrences of such changes come from four different interpreters spanning from working from 2004 to 2015. So I can't think really think of a requirement that's so strong that lasted 10, 11 years. Mm -hmm. um, it could be, so the problem is that with corpus data, I cannot make sure that it's really a personal choice or it's a requirement on that occasion. So with corpus data, I cannot fully answer this question. But um, the, qu the question is, if I'm completely honest, among the five occurrences of first person shifts that interact with institutional alignment, when I go back and listen to them, it does sound like we hope is a chunk in itself. For some interpreters, we hope is a chunk. They simply do not like, prefer we hope rather than I hope. So the possibility is there that this might be an institutional requirement, but currently the speech data that I collected um, would give more weight to the chunking explanation rather than the institutional alignment um, explanation. Can I have a follow-up question? Uh, sure, go <laughs> No, I just uh, uh, I think that's a very good point what Professor Wong mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. That it's just uh, also another point that uh, I already done that you might uh, consider uh, is that uh, how about the subjectivity of the the the, 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 the interpreter?
appropriate. Like, for example, if you're not instructed by um, a department that to do so, like when, uh, when it comes to hold, or uh, maybe like, in, uh, is that possible to study like this five interpreters like outside of this occasion? What if, um, if it's possible to compare with what in other occasions, not in the political discourse maybe, not with Li Keqiang maybe, but if you can prove that with, in other occasions, they also use this, or like um, that is just, a, as you said, a chunk yeah. for them, okay? That may be like one argument that you can say, like whether it is an instrument, an instrument by the government or not. It's just like, I think it's better to have a comparison if you want to answer your question first of all. That's a really good comment. So you are talking about the individuality of interpreters and to compare the norm on stage and off stage stage yeah. for a more robust finding. That's definitely a really fruitful animal of future research. I'm currently doing research on individuality, but I'm looking more about not just the individual person as a factor in the equation, but also their background their gender, and their education, age. So I won't be able to answer your question very soon, I hope. And as for the comparison of them on stage and off stage, the, the thing is with corpus data is that I'm not sure if it's ethical to collect what they would do off stage. I mean, like not off stage, but for example, you choose one of uh, who you should look for, a job. Zhang Lu, Zhang Lu, right? Okay, for example, Zhang Lu, but Zhang Lu not only maybe considered yeah. for Li Keqiang in the press conference, maybe in other occasions. Mm -hmm. And that would be a uh, comparable corpus to mm -hmm. say, like, okay, outside of this, right. just, just a suggestion. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, yes, I'll definitely consider that. But um, the thing is, all states, they all talk like what they are expected to talk. They all say that we honor the PRC's position first, and then we do our interpreting job. But actually, the data here shows that we need to measure, we need to assess how those discourse live up to the data. So comparisons would really be beneficial. But I would say that we also need to really see them as the complex persons that they are. They may say something, but they actually do something different. Thank you. Ah, so I want to go back to the issue of the institution. I mean, so maybe it's not necessarily that the institution requires them to do that, mm -hmm. but that when they receive their training, these habits are formed in the training. Because for example, when they make these shifts and the teacher is listening to their interpretation, maybe the teacher doesn't correct it because the teacher thinks mm -hmm. that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. And so then they form these habits, whereas if, for example, the teachers who were training them for two, three, four years, whenever they made these kinds of said, no, you can't do that, mm -hmm. then maybe they would be trained not to, yeah. you know, to make these kinds of shifts. So, I mean, if, if, if it's a small cohort of, of the interpreters and they are all coming out of the same institution, mm -hmm. it is possible that it's not, again, that it's not um, so much that they require them to do this, but that these habits are formed at that institution mm -hmm. because of an ethos or a tradition mm -hmm. at that institution. And if you looked at interpreters coming out of, say, I don't know, Geneva mm -hmm. or um, the big training centers for uh, Monterey, mm -hmm. maybe um, that would be an interesting way to see how robust your yeah. findings are, would be to look at, at training, people who are trained in different places, different mm -hmm. traditions. Mm -hmm. and see whether the same, uh, you, you see the same effects. Mm -hmm. no, that's a really good uh, comment as well. So um, I actually talked about this in my interpreting article. I said that I could only guess that such shifts involving institutional alignment may come from the work, education, uh, environment, context of, that, of the interpreters. So it's likely that interpreters were educated or institute, internalized this shift from I hope to we hope. But you said about, you're talking about the comparison between different schools. But the thing is, as I showed at the start of this talk, European Parliament's interpreters do the same. 
they would. There are studies. Yeah. Some of the studies by like yes. Tom or. Yes. Yeah. So these are English, German, German, English simultaneous interpreters. So this means that proficiency is not a variable here because they are working bidirectionally. So in the European Parliament, in Hong Kong government, by the staff interpreters of the simultaneous interpretation section, and by interpreters at the Chinese local governments, Guangdong, in Guangdong province, and central governments, those in the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So they come from a rather wide range, well, wide in interpreting sample size wise. So they come from a rather diverse educational background. So in this context, it's definitely a possibility, but we would need more data to examine whether this is possible. But also those studies were not using the multifactorial approach that you were using. Yeah. Uh, yes? Uh, I think the shift between knowledge and way is not is less of a question of right and wrong, rather than it, whether it is acceptable mm -hmm. in that situation. For example, when I was trying as a junior interpreter in my undergraduate studies, I think our teacher has specifically instructed that we are allowed to be 70% accurate in uh, simultaneous <laughs> interpreting. So and the basic information is got right, is, is conveyed uh, faithfully, that's okay. So in such a circumstance, I think the I way is of a minor question. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm thinking that uh, you can probably, in your future studies, that a comparative database would be the press release. Because in a conference, the consecutive interpreting is a very quick response. It requires time and mm -hmm. the reaction and the proficiency of certain interpreters. But uh, for such a conference, such a political event, normally there will be an official release which is issued by the Xinhua agency yeah. or the state council. So another approach is to examine in that news release or press release or other uh, official propaganda whether I and or we mm -hmm. are changed or remain intact in that text. Mm -hmm. and I think it will be a good supplementary to your argument, whether positive or negative. So that, that's my level of thought. That, that, those are two really good suggestions. But I'm really not sure, I'm really not sure about the accuracy of rate of being 70%. Oh, yes, it's not in this interpreting. And I oh, think okay. in consecutive interpreting, it, I think it's 90%. So we are allowed to make some little mistakes, but yeah. not some major issues. So that's, yeah, that's, that's true. But, and the threshold works for junior interpreters, but I actually talked with people who work in the central government in the ministries, and they said uh, the accuracy for bilateral meetings should at least be 90%, because they have all the transcriptions, and they would compare. So those who make it into the central government are really good interpreters. But for your second suggestion, that's a really good one. I actually did that. So uh, all the transcripts in my interpreting corpus come from the official releases. And I, have, I found that the official releases were heavily edited to remove the orality segment and the syntactical problems. And in some cases, we was changed into I. So for the censors, I think, they probably think we as a marker of orality, because it's more, maybe it may be seen as more carol. So in this case, this, this is definitely interesting, but 
it's more interesting in a, from the perspective of China studies than interpreting studies. Thank you for this.